Hey everyone, Ollie here. So I've been using the new MacBook Pros for a couple of weeks now. They're very powerful, that's for sure. But there's one interesting thing that I found out with my spec, the spec that I chose, and it makes me actually partly regret my decision. And you'll see why in this video. So I've personally ordered the 14 inch MacBook Pro with the M1 Max inside. It has the 10 core CPU, 24 core GPU, 32 gigabytes of RAM and two terabyte SSD. This spec came out to three and a half thousand dollars or 3,400 pounds. So it definitely isn't a cheap machine. I've been asked numerous times why I chose the 14 inch over the 16 inch. And it's mainly just due to the smaller form factor. I much prefer the smaller size of the 14 inch. It's also lighter, so it makes it easier to carry around. I usually go between home and work and I have an external display at both places. So if I need that screen estate, I just connect it up to those external displays. I have an LG 5K at home, and then I have a Pro Display XDR at the office. And yeah, I have no issues running those monitors. It works completely fine. No weird graphical issues like there have been with previous MacBooks. It runs buttery smooth. The design. So the most obvious thing about the new MacBook Pro is the new design. When I first saw it in the keynote and I saw some other unboxing videos, I actually didn't think it looked that great. I just thought it looked quite bulky and, and quite large looking. But now that I have one, it's actually a lot less bulky than it appears on camera. I also said in my unboxing video that it's thicker than the 13 inch MacBook Pro. I was wrong. If you actually look at the specs, the 13 inch is 1.56 centimeters thick whilst the new 14 inch MacBook Pro is 1.55 centimeters thick. So it's actually 0.01 centimeters thinner. It doesn't look it, but yeah, it's actually a thinner machine. So yeah, I hold my hands up. I was wrong in my unboxing video. On the bottom, there's a debossed MacBook Pro logo, which I think looks awesome. It's just a shame you won't see it that often. The keyboard has been updated and the touch bar has gone. Finally, I really, really didn't like the touch bar. We now have a full functional row of keys and the touch ID button remains. That touch ID button is also insanely quick. The keyboard also now has a black background, which I actually think looks quite cool. Overall, I think the design is great, especially when you compare it to the competition. If you look at other sort of pro grade Windows laptops, I personally think none of them are really as good looking as the MacBook Pro. At the same time though, design is relative. Everyone has their own version of what looks good. The ports. So one of the most important changes for me is the reintroduction of some of the ports that Apple removed. I'm just so glad Apple went back and added some of these ports back because they really do make a big difference. They realized that only having Thunderbolt ports probably wasn't the best idea and it's not really what pros wanted. On the left side, we have the MagSafe connector, two Thunderbolt ports and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. On the right side, we have another Thunderbolt port, a HDMI 2.0 port and the SD card reader. The SD card reader is the port that I'm most excited about, mainly because it's the port that I use the most and it was one that I was missing the most as well. I take a lot of photos, all of my videos that I shoot, YouTube videos and stuff are all shot on SD cards and just being able to put it into my MacBook without having to use any dongles is great. Some people have also been questioning why the HDMI port isn't a HDMI 2.1 port. I actually saw a great Reddit comment explaining why. Basically, there are four Thunderbolt channels in the M1 Pro and the M1 Max chip. Three of them are taken up by the three Thunderbolt ports that are on the machine. And then the fourth is being shared amongst the SD card reader and the HDMI port. Also Thunderbolt 4 is a four gigabit channel. HDMI 2.1 can use up to 48 gigabits. So technically Thunderbolt 4 can't actually support HDMI 2.1. I'm no expert, but it's just what I've learned so far from my research. The displays. So the displays on the new MacBook Pros have had a noticeable upgrade. For anyone interested, I'll leave a link to the wallpaper in the description below. We actually compared the display of the M1 MacBook Air with the 14 inch MacBook Pro and the difference in vibrance and contrast was instantly noticeable. The blacks were so much darker, the colors popped off the screen more and the general viewing experience was just leagues above the MacBook Air display. The MacBook Pros now feature Apple's liquid Retina XDR display with mini LED technology and ProMotion. They support a peak brightness of up to 1600 nits for HDR content, which is actually the same peak brightness as the Pro Display XDR. Although the Pro Display XDR only supports 60 Hertz refresh rates, so in some ways, the MacBook Pro displays are better as it supports 120Hz ProMotion. 120Hz ProMotion means it can change its refresh rate depending on what's on the screen. It's glorious and it makes some of the animations on macOS silky smooth and that's where I've noticed it most. There is some blooming, but only if you're really looking out for it. I usually only notice it when I'm seeing a bright white object against a completely black background. When watching movies and TV shows or looking at pictures, I don't actually notice it at all. Overall, it's a fantastic display and it's amazing that there's a whole computer attached to it as well. It makes the Pro Display XDR overpriced if you really think about it. It also makes me think that Apple could make a cheaper version of the Pro Display XDR, 
but one can only wish. I also want to thank Clean My Mac X for sponsoring this video. Whether you already have a Mac or are moving to a new one, Clean My Mac X is a great tool that you can use to clean up your Mac. Clean My Mac X has been a trusted app for more than 12 years since its launch. I personally use it myself and I see it recommended elsewhere too. Smart Scan is a feature that examines your system for system log files and user cache that is no longer needed. Smart Scan also does a quick malware check and runs optimization tasks to speed up your Mac and all of these will only take a couple of seconds. Space Lens is another great feature that allows you to see what files are taking up the most space. There are times where you might have several duplicate files taking up space on your drive. Space Lens helps identify and locate those files. Clear My Mac X also has an optimization feature, which helps you increase your Mac's performance by controlling what app and processes are running on it. The app is also beautifully designed and super easy to use. You can try Clean My Mac X for free. I'll leave a link to it down in the description below. And you can also use the code OLIA to get 30% off. There is also that notch. Apple have brought over the notch from the iPhone to the Mac. Understandably, there has been a lot said about the notch. I personally don't see why the notch is so big, especially considering there is no Face ID. Face ID makes the most sense on a Mac. I have a feeling it's something they're going to save for future models. At the same time though, the notch doesn't necessarily interfere with the screen estate. The notch simply fits into the menu bar. So like on the iPhone, when using the Mac day to day, the notch doesn't really interfere with most of what you're doing on the screen. The webcam has also been upgraded to 1080p, but in terms of clarity, it's really nothing to shout about, but it will do the job, I guess. To give you an idea of what the onboard mic sounds like, I'm actually using it right now for this portion of the video. Again, nothing that's going to blow you away, but it's more than adequate for calls. There's a new speaker system in these new MacBooks and it is actually super, super impressive. <music> MacBook speakers have always been pretty great compared to the competition. It's hard for me to illustrate what it's like on video. But trust me, it sounds so much better than you expect. It actually surprised me how good they were when I first tried them. Performance. So as I mentioned earlier, I've gone for the M1 Max chip with a 24 core GPU and 32 gigabytes of RAM. When it comes to Geekbench scores, CPU single core came out at 1752 and multi-core came out at 12,086. The GPU OpenCL score came out at 50,156. The performance on this thing is just insane. I've yet to really come across anything that really makes it struggle. The only time I've ever really seen it stutter is when I'm editing a video in Final Cut Pro and I'm quickly switching between clips that have lots of effects and layers and stuff. That's the only time it really sort of stutters. And even then it's very, very small stuttering, probably like half a second delay. To give you an idea of what I do day to day, I do quite a bit of design work in Figma. I have no issues there. If anything, the only thing limiting me there is actual internet speed. I do a lot of photo editing in Lightroom. I'm not a heavy photo shooter where I'm importing hundreds of photos at once, but I'll usually import anywhere between 20 to 50 pictures at any one time and quickly copy and paste edits between them. Not an issue there and changes appear pretty much instantly for me. And finally, I do a lot of video editing all of my videos are edited on my MacBook in Final Cut Pro, and it's just an absolute dream. It's noticeably faster than my previous 13 inch M1 MacBook. Exporting especially is insane as it renders videos much quicker. And whilst it's exporting, I can be in something like Lightroom editing the thumbnail for my videos. And it does all of this whilst rarely ever actually having the fans going. The only time I ever hear the fans going is when I render a video. And even then it doesn't do it for every render. It does get hot, but it's never gotten hot to the point where I feel like I can't touch it. So I did do some tests to see what the performance of the M1 Max chip is like. And yeah, it's it's actually very, very interesting and it's not what I expected at all. So I did a Final Cut Pro export, 13 minute video, 4K 422 10-bit video with a mix of 24 frames per second and 120 frames per second footage in a 4K timeline with a mix of effects and LUTs. It's actually my iPhone 13 Pro review video. The M1 Max exported the video in six minutes. Compared to the M1 Pro, that is five seconds slower, but it is also significantly faster than the previous M1 chip. Now this was very, very interesting because I was expecting the M1 chip to beat the M1 Pro easily, but five seconds slower, that didn't really make any sense. I tried exporting the video twice to see what would happen. I got the same results. I don't know if this is expected or if it's a bug, but yeah, for someone who primarily uses Final Cut Pro, making the jump from M1 Max might not actually be worth the money. So yeah, quite interesting. I also did a Blender render test, specifically the junk shop image render test. 
the M1 Max came out at 1 minute 47 seconds. So it's not crazy faster than the M1 Pro, but it is still faster and obviously significantly faster than the standard M1. So there is definitely a difference there. Those GPU cores are coming into play. And obviously as you do more complex sort of Blender renders, yeah, the time can really add up. This has got me thinking though, now that I've seen the Final Cut Pro results, if I could start again, I would keep the 32 gigabytes of RAM, but I would actually go for the M1 Pro instead of the M1 Max and that would save me $200, 200 pounds. I could go and return the machine, but honestly, it's not really worth the hassle as I need to order a new one and then wait a month for the new one. And then that means I'll be without a Mac for a month. So yeah, it doesn't really work. But yeah, if I could go back, I would actually go for the M1 Pro chip, battery life. So I have seen a few reviews mention how the 14 inch with the M1 Max chip isn't too great when it comes to battery life. So I actually don't think I'm the best person to answer the battery life question mainly because I have my laptop always connected to a monitor, well, connected to a monitor most of the time. So it's charging through the monitor. So I don't really sort of use the battery that much, but I did try a little test where I edited part of a video in Final Cut Pro for an hour. And in that hour, it went from 100% to 75%. So I burned through 25% of the battery in an hour. At that rate, I'm only getting four hours of battery life which is obviously not that great, but it's also not terrible considering the editing that I was doing in Final Cut Pro. The M1 Max ships just naturally burns through battery a bit quicker because of the GPU cores. So that's something to keep in mind when you're choosing your spec. If you want a good balance of battery life and performance, you would probably be better off with the M1 Pro chip. But the best thing about that new MagSafe port is that you can fast charge and you can go from zero to 50% in 30 minutes, which is pretty insane. But you will need the 96 watt power adapter for the 14 inch and the 140 watt power adapter for the 16 inch to get those fast charging speeds. So this is a really impressive machine and I feel like it actually deserves the Pro name. Apple should have never taken away the ports, but I'm glad they went back and added them back in. The MagSafe port is great and the fast charging feature really is an awesome feature to have. The HDMI port is a nice addition. It may not be HDMI 2.1, but it's ideal when you need it in a pinch and it's great when you're trying to present something. The SD card reader is definitely my favorite port because that's just down to how much I use it in my workflow. The display is stunning and it's great to see such a highly specced display in a laptop. The 1600 nits peak brightness really makes a difference when watching HDR content and the 120 hz ProMotion makes macOS animations look a lot smoother. The performance though is the most important part for me doing the type of work I do. Anything that can make my workflow significantly faster and smoother is a worthy investment. And that brings me to the price. So the base model 14 inch starts at 1999, but my spec, cost three and a half thousand dollars or three thousand four hundred pounds which is an incredible amount of money i'm not going to deny that but for me and in my work it's not actually that much in the grand scheme of things mainly because i can make that money back with just one sponsored video these machines are definitely targeted at the working professional where time literally is money like i said earlier though if i could go back i would order a 14 inch with the m1 pro because it just seems more than adequate for my work if you're someone who's purchased one of these machines let me know in the comments below which one you went with, which size, and what spec you went with. I'm really interested to see what my subscribers use, what you guys actually do for work, and why you would spend the money buying a machine like this. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter, and subscribe for more.